It's Tuesday, August 19th. Chinese sports officials remain devastated by hurdler Liu Xiang's inability to compete at the Beijing Olympics because of an injured leg. Currently, Liu will nonetheless enjoy a potentially bright future as glue. This is the current. Good morning, and welcome to the summer edition of the Current. I'm Susan Ormiston. Now, come on, be honest. How many of you watching the Olympics have hopped off the couch, guilted into doing some little bit of exercise? Well, I sure have. Those Canadian champions motivate even the slugs among us. But today on the Current, we've got another take on fitness. How about pop a pill instead of 20 push-ups? That's right, a couple of drugs which the researchers say mimic the benefits of exercise. Don't ditch the gym membership, though. They've worked on mice, not humans, yet. Also today, the ongoing threats of working in Afghanistan. Last week, two Canadian aid workers were gunned down, traveling in a well-marked aid agency vehicle. The Taliban used the killings to send a wider threat to Canadians delivering aid to Afghans. We'll ask one man who spends a lot of time in Kandahar how security is changing and we'll explore what this latest attack means for foreign aid to that country. And that's where we begin. Working in Afghanistan has always had significant risks, but this past week proved especially lethal. Last Wednesday, an Afghan driver and three foreign female aid workers, two of them Canadian, were ambushed and shot to death on a road south of Kabul. The Taliban has claimed responsibility. The three women worked for the International Rescue Committee, and in the wake of the attack, the IRC has suspended its humanitarian aid programs in Afghanistan. It's not the first. In 2004, Médecins Sans Frontières pulled out of Afghanistan after five of its staff members were killed by the Taliban. This time, to make sure its message got through loudly and clearly, the Taliban followed up the attack with an open letter to all Canadians. We waited for a long while and tried not to target the Western civilians, but we finally had to take revenge. And yes, We will do more, because they, the Canadians, are killing our children and women. They are not differentiating women and children with military targets, and we will not differentiate theirs too. That was Zabula Mujahid, a spokesperson for the Taliban. Drew Gilmore knows all about the threats aid workers face in Afghanistan. He's worked there since 2001. And back in March of this year, I met Drew and toured his projects firsthand at his work sites near Kandahar City. So what is this, Drew? This, actually, is the West Edmonton Mall of Zachary Kalai. <laughs> I mean, from a, from a collection of huts that had absolutely nothing here... Uh, This will be the the heart and soul, the the economic pulse of the village. To the far left down there will be a bakery. Next to the bakery, just in the center part, is a market. Already we expect 100 people to be working for this. So this is not just a project that we build and we walk away. This is going to thrive, grow, be bigger than us and, and run much longer than we'll be around. Drew Gilmore is the Executive Director of Development Works Canada. It's a social enterprise agency working in southern Afghanistan. And about 10 days ago, Drew came back from Kandahar and he joins me this morning in Ottawa. Hi, Drew. Good morning. Now, when I visited you with the, in March, we drove about a half hour south of Kandahar, toured the school and the market projects. You were cautious. You wore a bulletproof vest. We traveled with armed security, but of course you must have believed that it was safe enough to work there. Has the security situation shifted? 
perhaps it has in central uh, Afghanistan, Kabul, the s- southern parts. But if anything, I think the situation is more or less contained or controlled in Kandahar. Uh, when we were there, of course, uh, it was a dangerous area, a dangerous time, and it still is now. So I don't think there's been a significant shift uh, other than to say that where we work and what we do, it's it's quite calm and quite stable. So what's your response then to the letter from the Taliban specifically targeting this time Canadian aid workers? Uh, it's the usual deplorable, cowardly propaganda ploy, really. Uh, what is the difference from the Taliban uh, saying they're going to target Canadian aid workers as opposed to targeting, targeting any other aid worker? Uh, I think really uh, one should take it seriously, but t- also take it with a grain of salt. But does it send a ripple effect? Well, sure. I think that uh, it's saying that the game is evolving, perhaps, and that uh, where aid workers were yeah, aid workers were under threat. Perhaps the they are perhaps they are escalating the risk. I mean, we don't know. We we have to evaluate it day by day and see how the situation will change because of it. And are you ev- reevaluating? Uh, every day, every moment in the field, we we think uh, we try to think about our personal security. Is what we what we are trying to do? It is it right? Is it what the Kandahari want? Uh, is it necessary? Is it, can we do it? What's the risk involved? Is it worth the risk? This has this sort of process has to happen, uh, you know, every time that we're in the field. Now, the two Canadians among the four that worked for the IRC that were gunned down last week, a terrible, terrible incident. The president of the IRC is criticizing NATO for blurring these lines between aid work and security, thus saying that if the military is doing aid work and aid agencies are, it makes them closer tied, and that's why they become more vulnerable. Do you accept that? Yeah, it's a fair enough comment. Uh, in the early days, say three or four years ago, uh, it was very difficult to see uh, who was the military and who was an aid worker. Often the military would drive around in uh, white vehicles, which is usually the hallmark of uh, humanitarian agencies, doing much the same job. But I think that it's changed somewhat. Uh, certainly in Kandahar, I know that the military, the Canadian military, would rather leave the humanitarian actors do their own thing. Um, but uh, their point is, is well taken. Drew, stick around for a minute while I introduce us to another guest. Mark Sedra is a senior fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation and a research scholar in the Department of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. He's with me in our Toronto studio. Good morning. Good morning. Mark, how do you assess this statement from the Taliban, in fact, targeting aid workers? How will it affect aid work in Afghanistan? Well, I think that the attack on the the aid workers recently, the IRC aid workers, was an opportunistic attack. I don't think it was focused uh, specifically on Canadians. However, the Taliban have showed themselves in their propaganda to be somewhat politically astute. They recognize that the mission is somewhat unpopular in Canada, so they've used this propaganda targeting Canadians, warning Canadians about leaving the country and the dangers of staying in the country um, uh, in, in order to score maximum political points. Now, the IRC has been in this country 20 years doing aid work. They are suspending temporarily, at least for now, their work there. Do you think other aid agencies will do the same? Well, we've already seen many aid agencies in the south and east of the country scale down their work. And I think already many aid agencies are on a hair trigger um, in terms of um, the amount of risk that they're facing and the potential of actually further scaling down or even pulling out from the country. So I think that this does send the wrong message. Uh, I think it is there is a risk that if we see continued escalation of attacks focusing on soft targets, um, civilians and civilian aid workers, that we could see. Uh, more NGOs, more civilian agencies start to pull out. And we should remember that already many of these agencies are already limiting their movements um, so dramatically as a result of insecurity that, um, that their presence for some is almost irrelevant already. Drew, last February in Kandahar, an American aid worker was kidnapped, and a lot of foreign uh, aid workers left the area after that. You didn't. But do you think there will be an exodus now? I hope not. Uh, It's really hard to predict because I think that each agency has to review its activities and then match the security profile to it. Um, 
in our case, we're very fortunate because we work in just a few communities and we're able to have very deep, vibrant relationship with the community, with, with the Kandaharis themselves. Other agencies that have to scale across the province or in, indeed across the country, uh, you know, they they don't have that luxury of having such a close commitment to individual communities. So they, they might think once and twice again. You have described how you work so closely with Afghans in those communities in a way protecting you, but also obviously making your projects come alive. Also, though, you uh, employ a lot of Afghans. Um, they, f- you know, face extraordinary risks uh, working with aid groups. Is that risk increasing? I would think it's fair to say yes, uh, but my Kandahari colleagues, my Afghan colleagues, they believe. They believe in what they're doing. They they want to rebuild their country. They want to rebuild the future for themselves and their families and, and other Afghans. So uh, they're, they're not naive. They're not immature. They're not uh, – they're professionals, and they evaluate the risk, and, and they take the uh, decision to go forward in a very heroic way. Okay, I, I'm going to play a little bit of tape here. It's from Hashem Mayer. He's the deputy director of the agency coordinating body for Afghan relief. This is not the first time, you know, aid workers have been threatened and killed, and this will not be their last. Injuries are committed to work for the needy people of Afghanistan. They are ready to give sacrifices. The aid workers try their best, but, you know, there is possibility that they change position or suspend the activities in some uh, regions. But no, they will not leave. Mark Sedra, obviously, you know, he represents a lot of age agencies saying, we know this risk, this isn't going to affect us. Uh, do you think that kind of commitment can hold? I think so. I think uh, many aid agencies in Afghanistan have been working there for decades and, as Drew was saying, have deep roots with local communities. Um, and that is what provides them with a, a level of protection. So, I, I mean, I think that there is, we've seen the courageous work of, of different aid workers. We've seen the links that they have to these communities. So I think that their that their presence is enduring. However, you know, there's only a certain level of risk that any group can take take. And we have seen a steady escalation of insecurity, um, particularly in the south and east of the country, but more disturbingly starting to spread geographically to heretofore stable areas of central and western Afghanistan. Drew, what's your sense of um, the Taliban strategy from your perspective, living in Kandahar? Um, are they getting better at making political hay of these uh, terrible killings? Uh, of course, uh, they have their own uh, propaganda wing. They have uh, their own people committed to spreading alarm and dissension and insecurity. And it seems like they're they're getting on top of their game. For instance, in the the recent prison break in Kandahar, their propaganda network afterwards was, was pretty uh, was pretty effective. So I think this is just one part of their uh, insurgency. Are there things that um, aid agencies can do, Mark, to further protect their workers, foreigners and locals? Well, I think that NATO, uh, international military forces and aid agencies, just simply have to work closely together. Now, I understand the reluctance of many aid agencies to work too closely with the military, um, blurring the lines between civilian and military work that could put them at greater risk. But the reality is the Taliban have taken a strategic step to target aid workers. So they have to work with um, international military forces to provide safe areas, um, development zones where they can really move forward um, with development activities uh, um, in, in, a, in a stable area. Drew, uh, you've described your situation as being relatively safe, although that's a, a moving line, isn't it? Mm. What about your colleagues, though, all over the country? You've uh, lived and worked in Afghanistan for a long time. Uh, are there other ways that this aid can continue to be delivered safely? I think uh, the best way to increase the safety for all the aid, aid givers is to do more of it. Frankly, not enough is being done. Uh, the average Afghan is still not seeing enough results on the ground. By delivering the humanitarian aid that we promise and the development uh, aid that we promise, uh, that will that will enrich the lives of Afghans and it will uh, uh, let them realize that there is a future. And then you will then you'll de- degrade the uh, the support of the insurgents. 
I think we've got to get out there in the field and deliver more and better aid, and that will certainly uh, help the cause. Mark said Reseda is uh, promoting more projects in Kandahar. Civilian presence is, is growing there. Do you think that's the right thing for Canadians to do? I do think it's the right thing. I think that uh, the reality is that... Uh, the only solution to this conflict is 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 a is, there's a political solution and in providing development most afghans have not seen a peace dividend and in order to ensure their support you have to provide that all right gentlemen thank you so much mark sedra is a senior fellow at the center for international governance innovation and drew gilmore is the executive director of development works canada in our next half hour fitness in a bottle Researchers say they've developed a drug that mimics the effects of exercise with the none of the actual work. But there are few things you need to know before you ditch the treadmill. I'm Susan Ormiston. You're listening to the summer edition of The Current.